Hey, Margie here. Did you know that 17% of the population is suffering from something that many of us have never even heard of called mast cell activation syndrome? And the reason this is so important is because it could be a root cause of osteoporosis, osteopenia, as well as so many other conditions that are really reducing the quality of people's lives. So I'm so excited to delve into this because there's a lot that can be done. And our special guest is Dr. Kelly McCann. And Dr. McCann's passion for understanding why certain people develop specific conditions drove her beyond conventional medicine to study first complementary and alternative medicine, then integrative medicine, functional medicine, and environmental medicine, which led to an exploration of chronic infections and illness due to mold exposure. As a practicing internal medicine doctor and pediatrician, Dr. McCann utilizes her extensive knowledge of root causes, various modalities, and treatment options to guide patients to health in her thriving practice, the Spring Center, located in Costa Mesa, California. Dr. McCann lectures regularly at both national and international professional conferences. She is on the board of directors for two professional organizations, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. She holds board certifications in functional medicine, medical acupuncture, and integrative medicine. And in today's talk, we discuss what is mast cell activation syndrome? How does it affect our bones? And how do we know we have it? And what can be done? This is full of so much amazing information. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. McCann. I can't even tell you how happy I am to have you on the summit and this topic. And I know there are listeners whose lives are going to change because of this. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Margie, for having me. I'm excited to share this information with your listeners. Yes, because this is something most people I bet who are listening have never heard. And it almost sounds scary. I have to be honest with you. Right. But yet the good news is if, if this is something you have, and I mean, I couldn't get over when I heard the statistic that 17% of the population has this. So we're, we're not talking about some little thing that may affect one or two people. This is really affecting a large part of society and most people don't know and it can affect our bones and so many other aspects of our health. So, so tell us about mast cell activation as simple as you can, because it can be a little confusing. So why don't you explain what this is? Okay, I'll try. Um, so mast cells are a normal part of our immune system. They're bone, they are born in the bone marrow <clears throat> and then they move to our tissues and they live and they grow up and they live in the areas between our cells and the outside world. So they line our upper respiratory tract and our sinuses, they're in our mouth and our entire GI tract, they're in our lungs. Um, they love our nervous system, they're in our brain, they're, they line our, our nerves, blood vessels. And so they live everywhere and their job is to protect us from foreign invaders, what they perceive are foreign invaders. And here's the kicker. So if they start to have a misperception that a certain food or smell or something in our environment is not good for us, they are going to react or become activated. <clears throat> and they are filled with all these chemical messengers that we call mediators. And those chemical messengers are things like cytokines. And now with COVID, most people have heard about cytokines. You know, the cytokine storm is an inflammatory reaction. And it's the mast cells in many instances that are driving that cytokine storm by dumping or activating and releasing all of their mediators. And so with mast cell activation, they are dumping all their mediators when you eat things like tomatoes or avocados or something that they perceive is not good for you because um, they're doing their best to try and protect us. But in many people, this can cause a lot of symptoms. You know, the interesting thing is, so you do not have to have intestinal permeability to activate the mast cells. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. 
because they're just living there on the mucous membrane in your entire GI tract, waiting, surveilling for foreign invaders. And so you can have normal functioning GI, but start to have reactions. <clears throat> wow. So let's talk about symptoms because people are listening. And, you know, the interesting thing is that it can mimic so many things and so many people live, you know, as you, as you're going to go over them, so many people live with things. Oh yeah, I'm getting older. I have a little brain fog or I have a little of this, a little of that, not realizing that this could be possibly, you know, mast cell activation. So, so tell us what typical symptoms or some of the symptoms that, you know, we could really, you know, what people get from this. Sure. So just as I explained that these mast cells live everywhere in the body. That essentially means that any system in the body can be infected or can be affected by these mast cells uh, dumping their inflammatory mediators. So people can get general symptoms like fatigue, body aches. They can have um, temperature regulation issues. They can have sleep issues. Um, imagine that if they're being impacted in your sinuses. You can have runny nose, coughing, sneezing, allergy type symptoms. Um, if they're in the GI tract, you can have any sort of GI symptoms. You can have heartburn, reflux, diarrhea, constipation, gas, bloating, you know, symptoms that might be associated with leaky gut or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. <clears throat> so it gets a little confusing, but the patients who tend to have mast cell activation have sy symptoms in multiple systems. So you're not just going to have one symptom. Most of the time, you're going to have multiple system, systems involved. So you could have allergy symptoms. You could have GI symptoms. You could have chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath. Um, you can have muscle aches and pains. <clears throat> You can also have bone marrow issues, of course. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're talking to your, your audience. So you could have osteopenia, you could have osteoporosis, you could have an increased number of um, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, or low ones of those uh, white blood cells, platelets. Um, you could have anemia. Um, you can have clotting disorders. You can have um, <clears throat> gastrointestinal, I'm sorry, gastrointestinal issues, uh, bladder issues, female issues. Um, so as you can see, it's a long laundry list. So ways to think about it are, is it inflammatory, allergic in multiple systems in the body? Okay, so someone who, let's say, and we're gonna talk about bones in a minute, but you know, someone that's manifesting as osteoporosis or osteopenia, typically they'll have other symptoms as well from the people exactly. that you work with. Okay, exactly. That's good exactly. to know. They, and they, how, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You no, know, and how does so? How do you differentiate? How do you figure out that this is mast cell and not just you know something, some other type of inflammatory condition? Because so many of them sort of go together. Well, that's the interesting thing because. Mast cell activation tends to show up with other things. So you can have an autoimmune condition and also have mast cell activation and also have um, hypermobility. Um, hypermobility is when the joints are really lax. I am not an example, but, you know, so if your elbows bend beyond 10 degrees in the opposite direction, um, or your fingers are hypermobile and extra flexible, um, or your, you know, kind of hype, uh, flexi bendy type people, um, <laughs> double jointed as we, you know, we used to call it, um, or you were as a young person, oftentimes people with hypermobility can also develop mast cell activation. There seems to be a genetic predisposition for mast cell activation in people who are hypermobile. Um, we also see gastroparesis and gastrointestinal issues along with mast cell activation. So it's really the combination of a variety of different symptoms along with the osteopenia or osteoporosis that would lead me to suspect it. 
Okay, so when you suspect it, though, um, unfortunately, it's not easy. You can't just do a test. Oh, yes, you're set. You have mast cell activation. Can you just explain that with the testing, if that's accurate sure. or what, what you can even see from the testing? So the testing is a little complicated because some of these chemical messengers or mediators are very, um, they're very, what we call <clears throat> labile, meaning if they are exposed to too much heat, they disappear. Um, so they, the, the blood and the urine that people are submitting for the testing has to be handled in a very specific manner and not all labs can do it properly. They just don't know. <clears throat> um, and, and then it's complicated too, by the fact that there are hundreds, if not thousands of different chemical mediators, and we can test for maybe seven or eight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and my colleagues and I really feel that it is a clinical diagnosis. And so it's important to find a practitioner who understands mast cell activation and who has a broader understanding of it. Um, there are some allergists who recognize that mast cell activation um, syndrome exists, but they have slightly different criteria than, than my colleagues and I. And so we call this, we call the allergist consensus one, and they have very strict criteria. They're looking at a marker that's measured in the blood called tryptase. Tryptase is really a measurement of how many mast cells somebody has in the body. And so if somebody has the cancer systemic mastocytosis, they're going to have a high amount of tryptase. But with mast cell activation, it's an activation problem, not an overabundance of cell problem. Oh, okay. so, so typically tryptase is normal. <clears throat> the, the consensus one doctors, however, have this definition for mast cell activation where um, if you have a tryptase level at baseline that is doubled or, you know, plus 20%, then when you're in a flare, then you have mast cell activation. So very um, complicated um, diagnostic criteria. My colleagues, Dr. Afrin, Dr. Theodaris, Dr. Neil Nathan, uh, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, many people who are on my summit, which we'll talk about, um, are in the what we call the consensus two consensus um, with our definitions. And this is where it really is a clinical diagnosis. We love when we are able to get laboratory validation. And um, some of those labs include things like histamine, um, tryptase is checked. There's blood markers called chromogranin A. <clears throat> we can look for some things like prostaglandins, uh, leukotrienes, both in blood and urine. And there's um, certain ones that are available through commercial labs. Um, and ideally, we're getting lab values that you have two positives in your, you know, 13 or 14 that we're looking for. And they can be in positive at the same time, or you can have an elevated histamine at two separate times, and that would meet the criteria. But I okay. have hmm. plenty of people who don't have those lab values, who have all of the clinical, uh, meet all the clinical criteria for mast cell activation, and they have the diagnosis. Okay, so I'm hearing a few things. Number one is that people may go to their conventional doctor and even if it's an allergist and they say, no, you know, we tested you, you don't have this. But what you're saying from a functional medicine standpoint, there's other tests and we need to look at this a little differently because they could be missing it. Is, is that correct? Number yes, exactly. Okay. And the other question I have is since it is an inflammatory condition and also, you know, other things may cause it that are inflammatory, will you see elevated homocysteine and elevated C-reactive protein? Will you Not see that? Not necessarily. No, Not okay. necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Those could be different inflammatory pathways. Now you might, especially if they have an, a 
concurrent autoimmune condition, but not necessarily. Okay. Not okay. Because so those are typically a lot of people, you know, listening, those are typically inflammatory markers that may be tested, you know, with people with osteoporosis and osteopenia. So I was wondering the correlation. Interesting. Okay. So let's go into bone. How does this really affect our bones? And I'm so big into root causes and that we need to dig beneath the surface and see. And I really, this is something that I don't test for or even think about. So I'm excited that you're going to really share with us why this is important and something I think from now on, it's going to open our eyes up to. Yes. So think about it this way, that all of those inflammatory mediators can impact bone. Now, mast cells are bone born in the bone marrow, right? And then they go to the periphery and they produce all these inflammatory mediators. So in some patients who have <clears throat> uh, what we would call like a secondary osteoporosis or osteopenia because they have osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, those mast cells could be producing certain chemicals, histamine, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, and those can start to break down some of the bone. Mm. So you start to get the osteopenia and osteoporosis. Now, um, there is still some um, certain circumstances where the inflammatory reaction might produce a uh, bone building, uh, the osteoblastic uh, factor, um, particularly when you're dealing with healing. So if you break your bone, the the mast cells and the other aspects of the body that help build the bone and heal that fracture um, can become engaged and participate. But for most of the time, when we're not dealing with an acute issue, when we're dealing more with a chronic issue, um, that could be one of the potential presentations in a mast cell patient would be an an otherwise unexplained osteopenia, osteoporosis because of those inflammatory mediators. Oh, so interesting. So let's talk about what, you know, I guess let's talk about what triggers, you know, what are some of the triggers of the, of the mast cells that people should be aware of? Because if they've had exposure or, you know, things through their lifetime, you know, maybe they haven't connected the dots. Right. There are many things that trigger mast cell activation. You know, just as I explained at the beginning, the mast cells are part of our immune system that are looking for foreign invaders. So they're really trying to protect us. And, you know, we have to think about them as not as the bad guys, but as the good guys who are trying to protect us, who, you know, get went a little rogue, right? <laughs> so they went a little off, off script and uh, they're, they're, overactive. So what are the things that are going to trigger your immune system? And one of the biggest ones is mold exposure. Mold exposure is rampant in so many places in the U.S. Where I live in California, I have lived in 10 houses in 13 years now. And I would say nearly all of them are a little moldy and some of them have been profoundly moldy. And wow. when you have a high burden of exposure to mold in a genetically susceptible person, that can trigger mast cell activation. That's very interesting. Does it matter at what point in your life you were exposed to mold? Could it have been years ago and you still can be suffering? Um, good question. I think that that is possible. Um, because it sensitizes you to new exposures. You know, I, I come from this, from a functional and kind of um, uh, environmental medicine perspective. In environmental medicine, we think about our bodies as a sink or a bucket or a barrel. And everything that we've ever been exposed to over the course of our lifetime gets dumped in our bodies, dumped in our barrel. And at some point we reach a threshold above which we just can't tolerate those, those exposures. 
And so if our bucket gets filled up really early on, we're going to express um, symptoms earlier on then, right? Makes sense. Yeah. Do you recommend then that people are tested for mold? Do you do that in your practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in fact, it is one of the most uh, common things that makes people sick. And it makes people sick in um, in all of the systems of the body too. So brain fog, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, all of the symptoms of mast cell activation can be symptoms of mold exposure, which also can be symptoms of things like Lyme disease and some of the other infections that go along with Lyme disease. One in particular is called Bartonella, which some of your listeners might've heard of cat scratch fever. So cat scratch fever, it's a Sammy Hagar song, I think in the seventies, <laughs> I'm dating myself. Um, so cat scratch fever or Bartonella is even more common than mold. I'm sorry, even more common than Lyme disease. And it is often a trigger for mast cell activation. Um, so if people have been scratched by a cat, bit by a cat, um, fleas, you know, ticks, mosquitoes, many of these insects carry these infections that can set somebody off. And oftentimes with mast cell activation, it, it may not be one thing, like I mentioned with the, the total body burden. So you could have had a mold exposure as a kid, and maybe you got Lyme disease as a kid, but you were okay. And then you get into a car accident and then, then you see an increase in some of your symptoms or you go through some other sort of traumatic event and then you get another mold exposure and bam, now you're super sick. Interesting. So is there anything that would differentiate? So someone who has just, let's say, mold exposure versus someone who has both mold exposure and mast cell, you know, activation. Is there something that you'll see different that could say, oh, yes. Very good question. Um, it's the level of sensitivity that somebody with mast cell activation presents with. So someone who has difficulty tolerating certain kinds of medications, they may have difficulty tolerating supplements, you know, so they'll come in and they're already beyond um, allergy medications because they just feel better taking Zyrtec or Claritin or Benadryl every night to sleep because they don't sleep very well. And this is something that they found helps. Um, so that's a clue. <clears throat> People who have a long list of things that they're aller allergic to um, is often a clue. Um, people who have trouble walking down the aisle in the grocery store where all the laundry and cleaning products are because the scents and the smells trigger headaches, migraines, things like that. Um, those people are much more likely to have mast cell activation. So it's really, um, the difference is in the level of sensitivity as well. Oh, interesting. And do they respond differently? So you're saying, I mean, I can think of so many people now who just can't tolerate supplements or just can't tolerate things to the extreme. So yes, <laughs> they all have mass <laughs> Especially when you said 17% of the population, I'm, <laughs> I am sure they do. And so what are the mean, what are some of the treatments that you use that have been, I mean, the good news, let's just tell everyone there's good news that your people yes. are getting better. Yes. <laughs> the, the good news is once you recognize that you are a sensitive person and that you probably have dysregulated mast cells that are doing their best to protect you, we need to calm them down. And there are so many tools at our disposal to help calm down this aspect of our immune system. We can use, there are certain medications. So as I mentioned, antihistamines, um, things like Zyrtec, Claritin, Zizol, Allegra, <clears throat> Benadryl. Um, there are prescription versions of that. So those are what we call H1 or histamine one receptor blockers. They work fantastic for some people. And, you know, for some people I have to give them um, two or three times a day. I had a, a woman who had <clears throat> osteoporosis, you know, she's elderly, she's in her seventies and she's got chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and auto, um, so autoimmune issues. And she's got a, a <clears throat> 
autonomic nervous system issue where whenever she stands up, her heart rate shoots up and her blood pressure drops. Um, so she's got some dizziness and some balance issues. Um, and she had chronic diarrhea for 20 years. And a man, as a functional practitioner, I tried everything. <laughs> so How miserable, right? 20 yeah, years, so oh my God. Miserable. <laughs> but the amazing thing was when we gave her Zyrtec, three times a day, she went from having diarrhea like 10 times a day to one or two normal stools a day. And she was like, hallelujah. <laughs> wow. How interesting is that? That's <laughs> so fascinating. Um, mm. So then there are so many supplements that are really, really helpful um, at quieting down those mast cells. And the trick is that although there are many different tools in the toolbox, everybody is unique. And so we have to dial in and figure out what are the things that work best for you. And most of the time it's multiple things because there are many pathways of inflammation that are being um, expressed. And so we have to block different things. So some people do great with quercetin. Some people do great with turmeric, resveratrol, pycnogenol, um, perilla seed extract. Um, some people do very well with things like CBD, uh, ashwagandha, <clears throat> holy basil. Um, there are, you know, I have a long, long laundry list of potential supplements to help. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of in the, the oral uh, oral way of, of treating things. But then we have to also try and calm down the autonomic nervous system and the limbic system in the brain, because all of those systems are working together to protect you because your body and your, your limbic system, your autonomic nervous system are perceived that the world is a dangerous place. And so we have to retrain the brain, the autonomic nervous system, and the mast cells to calm down, to recognize that it is safe. Oh, so interesting. And we talked a little bit about diet and certain of the foods that you know, cause a histamine response. But what about exercise? Does that play a role in this? And is that part of the treatment at all? You know, that's a good question. Many patients with mast cell activation are so sensitive that um, exercise tends to trigger their mass cells. Mm. And so it's this catch 22 that they might have, you know, um, post exertional malaise or post exertional um, kinds of symptoms. And so oftentimes, unfortunately, until they're getting better, until things are calming down, some people have a difficulty being able to exercise. Um, <clears throat> And in my experience, whether the mast cells are being triggered by mold or Lyme or Bartonella or environmental chemicals or any of these other things, we can't really get into the treatment of these other things until we get those mast cells more calmed down. Wow, that makes it even more important because if you do have osteoporosis or osteopenia, exercise is so important and not exercising is a further risk factor and it's just going to lead to more bone loss. So you need to really get to that root cause and not just mask the problems, but to really figure this out so you can improve. So why don't you tell us, there's two things I want you to tell us about. One, your experience, because I find that so interesting. You just didn't decide, oh, I'm going to work on mast cell activation. <laughs> why don't you explain your story? Because I think I always love to know why someone's so passionate and how you evolved into this specialist that, you know, has, that really has an expertise in this area. Thanks for asking. So I have my own Lyme mold uh, mast cell story. <laughs> um, I grew up in upstate New York, my mom had Lyme disease unbeknownst to us. Uh, she probably gave it to at least one of my sisters and myself. Um, and, you know, I was always that allergic kid uh, in, in high school, had terrible allergies. And this is a pretty common history. So for those people listening, um, mast cell activation tends to start when you're young. You have these like inflammatory allergic type 
presentations. And so that was me. I was the allergic kid. I needed to take Zyrtec or something similar uh, for much of my um, early life. And then <clears throat> I grew up in a moldy basement too, which I'm sure didn't help. Um, and then was exposed to mold when I moved, uh, especially to Oregon. My office was a flat roof building in Western Oregon where it rained all the time and there was a ton of mold there. And I started developing a lot more symptoms. I became um, chronically fatigued. I had fibromyalgia type symptoms. I was depressed. Um, I had insomnia. I would just wander around my house at night. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get myself to sleep. Um, <clears throat> and then fortunately was able to leave Oregon, moved around a little bit and over time got better and then moved to California, eventually moved into another moldy house. And, you know, at that point I have been gluten-free and dairy-free for years, but all of a sudden developed lots of food sensitivities. My list of Food sensitivities went from gluten and dairy to almonds, peas, rice, oranges, apples, strawberries, tomatoes, corn, soy, peanuts, eggs, um, you name it. It got really long um, and I knew something was very wrong. I um, was able to figure out that there was mold in that rental house that I had. I got rid of everything that I owned in order to get better and moved. Um, other symptoms that showed up at that time, I started developing hives. I would get, you know, my, my body would be covered in hives and just itchy all over the place. Um, I would eat something um, that wasn't even on my list and I'd still get hives. Uh, so lots of symptoms there too. And and the cool thing about mast cell that I was really drawn to was the fact that so many systems of the body were involved. You know, so it wasn't like a, a single system kind of issue. This was perfect for functional medicine, integrative medicine, um, internist and pediatrician who does everything, right? So I was... Um, Wait, excuse me, were you into functional medicine at that point? You already were. Okay. Yes, okay. I already was. Okay. And so it just meant there were, there were tools in my toolkit that I could utilize to help not only myself, but all the people I started seeing walking through my door who had all these sensitivities and allergies and inflammation and mold exposure. You know, I learned about mast cell activation after I had already been <clears throat> seeing mold and Lyme disease in my practice. And so you treated yourself then? And so I treated myself, yes. And what happened? <laughs> and fortunately now, well, I had been doing really well. And then um, we found out mold in the next place that we lived. And so mm, just recently got rid of all this stuff that my husband and I owned. And uh, yeah, this is, these are just props in the back. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of in disarray. Um, but yeah, we're doing it again, unfortunately. Um, but the, I think the good news is you're able to manage it and, and yes. live a very, very complete, healthy life. <laughs> yes. So lots of supplements, um, lots of antihistamines. And yeah, the, the uh, hives have definitely come down. The allergy symptoms are much more manageable. Um, so yeah, there is so much hope. Um, I think that that's the important thing. So much hope and so many uh, tools in the toolkit for helping people. Right. People just need to realize that this is a possibility. So on that note, you, you're doing something amazing that I'm so excited about to really bring this out to the world and tell us about your summit because that's happening pretty relatively soon. Yes. So the summit is called the Many Manifestations of Mast Cell Activation Syndrome. And it is launching through Health Talks Online or Health Means at the end of August, August 29th through September 4th. It is a free event. Uh, there will be six or seven lectures that get released each day that people can listen to. And I have uh, put together a list of over 40 uh, practitioners who may not look be well known to the public, but they are brilliant 
experts in this field. And I'm so excited about the summit because there's so much fantastic information available in the summit. I really think that there's something for everyone. I have gastroenterologists, I have cardiologists, I have hematology oncologists who are specialists in mass cell activation. I have physical therapists um, and people who have been mold exposed. And I have mold remediators and mold inspectors who can explain what this is all about. I have people who have been, um, their mast cells have been triggered by uh, EMF. So, you know, electrical magnetic frequencies can also trigger mast cell activation. Uh, Lyme disease, as I mentioned, I have a couple of specialists on uh, chronic infections, environmental toxins. And so it is a wealth of information um, <clears throat> for this for this topic. And it is the first top the first event on this topic. Um, I you know, I like to I like to let people know that mass activation is so new. The first case studies in the medical literature, were published in 2007. Wow. It, this is not old. This is, you know, 15 years old. That is very, very new as a condition. And I think Dr. Afrin wrote his book, Never Bet Against Occam, in 2014. So this is cutting edge stuff. And you can listen to it on the summit, which is just a few weeks away. Um, and it's all free. Oh, I'm so excited having my own summit, working as well with Health Talks Online, who I think is just an incredible company, but you really get the word out there and you really expose people who have no idea about this, really learn about it. It can deep dive. And, and I just know, oh my gosh, I know even from the podcast lives will be changed, but I can only imagine from the summit with all the information. And since this is something that affects so many people and really just not you know, people are not aware of this in both, in both conventional medicine. It's not something all functional med. Am I right about that? Oh, or all yeah. functional medicine doctors, it's not something they're that's on the top of their list when they're looking at what the problem may be. Right, exactly. Um, you know, because it is so new, there there aren't a lot of functional doctors. You know, it's just becoming more well known. Um, there are a few professional organizations that. <clears throat> that may be better resources. So if you have practitioner, or I'm sorry, if you have patients out there looking for pr practitioners who are much more likely to know about mast cell activation, I could recommend a few. One of them, I'm on the board, it's the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness or ISEAI.org. We call it ICEA, <laughs> um, ICI. And, um, they, those practitioners are much more likely to know about mast cell activation. Um, and then obviously the specialists who are on the summit are good resources too. Wow, this is just really exciting. I'm just so glad that our paths met and I learned about the work that you're doing. And I, you know, as soon as I heard about it, I'm like, have to have you, I have to have you on the summit because you now the summit, I have to have you on the podcast because you know, this is something that is not known about. And I'm such a big believer in finding root causes. And, you know, because too many people are living, I just believe you have to live your best life. And part of that is living your best health. And, you know, it, it's hard to be happy and do things when you're feeling miserable. And especially when people tell you, oh, I'm sorry, there's nothing wrong with you. Because a lot of people get that, you know, now your labs are fine. There's nothing wrong with you. It's in your head. You know, you're, you're just fatigued, whatever it is. And so many of the symptoms that you're describing fall into that category where people just like, something's wrong with me. I have no idea. And they're not able to live their best life. So there's more tools and more strategies and more things available. So I just can't thank you enough for, for doing all the work. And I know how hard a summit is. And I know, <laughs> I, I know firsthand how much work it is, but it's so worth it when you see all the, all the thousands of lives that are going to be changed. But is there anything else that you want to share before? I will have all your links to the summit as, you know, as well as, you know, ways people can contact you in the show notes, but is there anything else you want to share with people before we end? You know, I think that, <clears throat> one of the most important things is really to have hope 
to be your own advocate. Don't take no, your, it's all in your head for an answer that is not an answer that is, um, that's just laziness as far as I'm concerned. Right, I agree. Um, yep, that's you know, my there, motto too. Yep. <laughs> there are practitioners out there who will advocate for you, who will help you figure this out. But m- much of the time you have to do it yourself. You have to educate yourself. You have to do your own research and you have to seek out those practitioners who can help you. Um, but there is hope you can get better. You do not have to continue to suffer as the super canary in the coal mine with all of these symptoms that, that is, that does not have to be your life's legacy. Oh, well, that's a great way to end. And thank you again for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time and lots of luck with the summit. I I can't wait. I'm going to be listening because to me, I'm learning so much about this. This is all new. So I'm very excited as well. So I will be listening. Thank great. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you again, Margie. This has been really fun. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. McCann, and now I have an understanding of what mast cell activation syndrome is and how it could be the root cause of osteoporosis, osteopenia, and so many other conditions, and it's something that just may have been missed. And the good news, there's a lot that can be done. All the links that Dr. McCann talked about, including the link to her upcoming summit, will be in the show notes. And please share this with anyone you think can benefit. So thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.